Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving a very, very warm welcome to Mr. James Creighton. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that just means I'm old and crusty. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction, and, and thanks. I know I'm the last stop between you and, and some refreshment at the ambassador's house. So uh, I will keep to my time, and hopefully my, my intent is to, to open uh, the floor up to questions. And I've, I've outlined my, my discussion in, in three topics. Um, and and the, by way of introduction, the one thing, uh, after 30 years in the Army, I ended up in Erzgan. And I commanded 10 different countries and was responsible for several hundred million dollars worth of development. And so the impact of working with uh, various different countries with different cultural values, cultural norms, uh, but all with the best intentions. And that's from the Afghans to the NATO countries to the other than NATO countries. And so I'm excited to be, able, to be able to talk to you today and to give you some thoughts, but more importantly is to get your questions. I divided my talk into three different portions. I think the first is the best intentions. Second is what are the challenges, both from an environmental perspective and from an execution perspective? Because in all cases, it's an extremely complex and difficult environment. And so understanding that from first hand is something that I hope to relay uh, some thoughts to you. And then the last uh, section, the third one is, how do you sustain it? What, what is the way ahead? And so looking at, at best intentions, United Nations is a great example, UNDP, UNAMA, United States Assistance Mission, Afghanistan, NATO, EU, U.S., you know, hundreds of countries uh, involved throughout the world in, in helping. And they look at it and they say, listen, how, how do we make the world a better place? How do we make this, the world a safer place? And some of that is self-preservation by making the world a uh, safer place than you and your own countries are safer. And then part of that is just from the heart. I mean, you look at the, the pain and despair in some of these countries and you say, listen, they, we can do something about this and make it better. And so you look at it and you say, well, schools, roads, clinics, building capacity, whether it's doctors and nurses or whether it's teachers or trades, simple electricians and, and carpenters who make things and, and build that capacity that you need in each one of these countries. How do you do that? And there's a massive amount of money associated with that and a massive amount of goodwill. And, and the, the question is, how do you do that so that it's effective? How do you do that so that at the end of the day, those best intentions don't actually fuel violence and conflict? They don't make it worse. And I've seen firsthand, as many of you in this room I'm sure have, that the best intentions can, in fact, fuel more violence and conflict if they're not done uh, in a culturally sensitive way. The, uh, so the challenge, I divide it into two, into two compartments. The first is the environmental challenges. So you're looking at court cultural norms. I grew up in Los Angeles, California. I grew up in, in the United States, but I've been around the world. So I show up in Erzgan, I'm clearly a Western, I've got a Western set of values. How do you help that population without imposing your values on them? How do you balance a set of, of norms um, that can enable you to achieve your mission? And, and when I looked at my mission, I had about 6,000 troops and civilians. My only mission was to make the governor successful, to help the government, the government of Erzgan, a small province in the middle of Afghanistan, earn the respect of their people. And the challenge is with a cultural mindset that's different. And so a lot of listening is required. And God gave you two ears and one mouth for a reason. You're supposed to do twice as much listening as talking. 
And, that, and that, it, to me, that was sort of a, a thought process that you go through to understand where their priorities are and how you can help them achieve their priorities. But being able to ba balance cultural norms is, I mean, it, it's, it's really step number one as you go in. There's a values mismatch. And I, I just, you know, the example uh, is, if you remember a couple years ago, the Time Magazine did a story on Aisha. And she was the, the young lady that had gotten her nose chopped off uh, because she had violated the family's uh, edict on who she was going to marry. And, and she was from Khazarzgan, which was part of my province. And so how do you balance that, which from, you know, from a UN perspective, from my perspective, is culturally and criminally horrible, but an accepted practice within the culture. And that's just an extreme example of those decisions that you have to make on what do you accept and what don't you accept. And, and it's very difficult. How do you deal with the corruption? In the United States, we build airfields in states and counties where there are no aircraft. And they go nowhere. Why do you do that? Well, because a congressman wants to get elected. And he gets the money appropriated through Congress. And we don't call that a corruption. We call that politics. So the, the idea, though, is understanding what the cultural norms are and what is corruption and what isn't corruption. And clearly in Afghanistan, there are gross examples of corruption from an Afghan perspective, let alone from a U.S. perspective or, a, or an international perspective. And so understanding those cultural norms and being able to balance your assessment. And we, you know, we worked with the Afghan government to remove corruption in many cases. But in other cases, we just weren't able to do it. And so, you know, understanding what that is. The drugs uh, unique, I think, in Afghanistan in some ways. Uh, you know, the poppy is the state, Calif the state flower of California. But uh, taking a 10-year-old kid into the hospital that is unresponsive to the medicine required to relieve his pain as he goes through a surgery because he is so addicted to the opium because of his harvest, not because he's not because he's doing opium or heroin. It's just because of the harvest process. So it's rampant, and, it, and it's, a, it's a huge challenge. Balancing expectations. The expectations of the people who look at you. I mean, you, you talk to people in Erzgan, and they think, well, you're from the United States, and so, so therefore you can do anything. And this is discussions I've had many times. And the expectation is that if something bad happens, it's obviously because the United States wanted it to happen, because they can do anything. And if something good happens, it's because the United States wanted that to happen. And so trying to understand that, you know, we're, we try to be good people, but at the end of the day, we can't do everything. It's the, same, it's the same with the EU. It's the same in the United States at home for me. Well, you're going to go over there, and, and no one's going to die. You're going to go over there and we're going to spend X billions of dollars and everyone's going to have clean water and all kids are going to go to school. And so balancing expectations internally within the country and then externally within the supporting countries is a challenge. It's a difficult environment. Statistics. The last census in Afghanistan, by my records, 1974. So how many kids are there in Erzgan? if the last census was done in 1974. So how many schools do you need? How many books do you need? How many inoculations do you need? Shoot, I don't know. The governor didn't know. And so you get numbers in Erzgan that says there's 120,000 people in Erzgan, unless you ask the governor. If you ask the governor, it's 1.2 million. So somewhere between 100,000 and a million is your requirement that drives how much you need. It's an environmental expectation. It's just something you got to work through. Rule of law. The people believe that the tribal elders are the ones, and the mullahs are the ones 
them that adjudicate. They're the ones that provide the rule of law that, that maintain stability and peace within the organization. But by the same token, you have a federal government in Kabul. And so how do you balance that rule of law? Who, which cases are adjudicated by whom? Where does the governor rule? Where does the chief justice rule? And where does the tribal elder or the mullah rule? And those, are, those lines are not easily determined. So those are some of the environmental challenges. Moving, moving forward to the execution. How much do you pay for a school in Afghanistan? It's about 60,000 bucks if you're an Afghan. If you're in the coalition, if you're in the World Bank, if you're in the Asian Development Bank, it's about 120,000, up to 600,000. Why? Because we're not, I had a boss who was very colorful and I won't use that language in the United Nations. <laughs> Sometimes we, we don't execute with the most uh, informed decisions. And what you do is you end up making a contract in Kabul and then you subcontract to Kandahar, you subcontract to Karakot, and then you give the money to the guy on the ground in Erzgan, but you've already paid 60% of the money you've paid is to the subcontractors throughout the chain. And by the time you get there, let's say 200000 you're down to a $40,000 school. But what you've done is you've removed yourself 600 miles from the point of contact between where the school's being built and where the contract was let. And so your quality assurance and your quality control and your oversight of that project are zero, L literally zero in many cases. Now, I've seen beautiful schools, beautiful clinics, jails, you name it. It can be done. But too many times we saturated the capacity of the country of the province and the district to execute it effectively. And so what you ended up with is what I call monuments to ineptitude. Where you walk in and you look at the school, it's 70% done, but the quality on it is so bad that all you can do is tear it down. Or you walk into the police station that's 70% done, it's been, it's been uh, abandoned for two years, but it's been guarded because it's well built, but not occupied. And then you have to go through the bureaucratic nightmare of trying to figure out how to fix it. And you run into the challenge of standards. This is a fact. Walk into a police station in Afghanistan, 70% done. They stop working. Why? Because the handrails leading into the building were of the wrong diameter. And there was no access for wheelchairs. Excuse me? Those are U.S. standards being applied from a, you know, from a U.S. perspective in Afghanistan. And so for two years, the police, off, the police chief occupied an absolutely abysmal building when there was a beautiful facility that had been built for him but not finished because of bureaucratic craziness. And so, I, I mean, just and from an execution perspective, it's, it's challenging. Uh, local and tribal. So we built a school. You put it in an area, and it's not occupied. Why? Well, because you fail to coordinate between the two tribal elders. One tribe will occupy it, but the other won't. So the, other, so the one tribe occupies it, and then they get into a scuffle because you failed to coordinate. Same with water. You build a dam. Tribal elder comes and says, build a dam. Great, build a dam. You put the dam up. Three months later, the Taliban attack. It's not the Taliban, it's the, it's the tribe downstream who now doesn't have water and has attacked the guys upstream, who they've been living quietly with for a thousand years, by the way, because we've gone in with the best of intentions, but with a failure to properly coordinate and communicate at the, at the local level. And so we've caused more problems. It's not the Taliban, it's us. It's, it's trying to do the right thing, but not with, the, not with enough knowledge. So what I've tried to outline is environmental and execution challenges that you work your way through and you, and you do the best you can. So the question now is how do you sustain it? And some people say, well, you do Afghan first. Let the Afghans do the work. They've got to build the capacity. You've got to let them do it. But oftentimes we've created projects that are so big that they don't have the capacity to do it. 
And what we've done, I've seen this, it drives me nuts. You give them the project, you say, you guys do it, build the capacity. And they come back and they fail. And anyone that had any common sense would know that we're going to fail because they just didn't have the trucks or the drivers or the ability to do it. And so the idea is how do you together work together to build that capacity without demonstrating that they're failures? Because not only is the truck driver a failure because he failed to deliver the load, but the governor's a fail failure because he failed to deliver what he said he was going to deliver. And so now that people look at the government and their failures, and you haven't helped anyone, even though you had the right idea, which is to build the capacity to let them do it when you leave. So in my mind, the funding is critical, uh, maintaining the funding, maintaining the level of support, capitalizing on the 30% increase in education, or 22% in, 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 uh, in literacy, 37% in the, in the human uh, index. Um, the roads, I was in Kabul two weeks ago, the roads that 10 years ago were dirt are now, are now paved. It's a, it's a dangerous place right now. But the amount of cars on a road that are new are staggering. The, the kids going to school continue to improve. There is hope. There's, there's, a, there's a good president, a good chief executive officer. They're trying to make things happen. But the challenge is, how do they do that knowing that the international community is moving away? That Afghanistan is no longer in the forefront of thought process. And so when you look at this from a larger perspective of development and, and, and how do you do development long range, it's a long-term commitment. Korea was in a worse place 70 years ago than Afghanistan is today. It was absolutely devastating. And yet Korea is now, I mean, you read the numbers, 11th, 10th largest economy in the world. And so it can be done. It, it can be done uh, if you have the right attitude, if you have the, the right longevity. Um, so there's good people trying to do the right thing in Afghanistan and, and outside of Afghanistan. And I, it's my hope that at, at, from an international perspective, they take the long, the long view on it and, uh, and capitalize on the investment, capitalize on the gains that have been made. So I think I'm within time. And uh, Mark, I'd like to open up for questions if you have time. And if anyone's interested, I can answer any questions. Sir. Hi, my name is Zeke. Uh, I'm also from Los Angeles, like yourself. Um, were you talking about how? I'm not sure if this is working. Oh, here we go. Uh, oh, yeah. Sorry. Oh, yeah. There there we go. <laughs> you talk about how when we have these countries going with the best intentions, they often have this hole in a china shop effect that we try to extrapolate our way of life into an entirely separate part of the world, and it just doesn't work out that way. Afghanistan is not the only place this has happened. Just use the U.S. as an example. There's tons of countries we can say this for. And what I want to know is, is, is your opinion on this. Do we then have the moral obligation to do what we can to fix it, to stay involved, to try to solve the situation? Or is it overall better, when you talk about the long term of things, to, to cut our losses and say, well, this country is better equipped to handle it. The old country is better equipped to handle it in retreat. Yeah, I, I mean, I, uh, that's a very complex and it's a political question. I've looked too many people in the eyes well, we've signed a contract and we said we're going to do this. And, and I, I grew up in a very simple society. When you say you're going to do something, you do it. So um, I, I, I think that where, where the choice point is not now, but 10 years ago when you decide to go in. And, and you know, anyway, that's a short answer. Let me get to some other questions. I can take it further. Yes, sir. Um, I major in the uh, from high army, so I also have the army background. Uh, so my question is uh, also in Thailand, we also the insurgency in the down south of Thailand, and it's our, uh, already, already 10 years. And we try to conduct a military operation to maintain the, the security. But 
uh, the problem is still there. We cannot solve it. It's like uh, the U.S. Uh, deploys the military in Afghanistan. So, like, uh, this is the reason why I come to cultural diplomacy. What type of type of soft power way to to solve this problem? So, like, I'm thinking about the how to conduct the I/O, the information operation by put the culture of diplomacy, how to carry on, how to send the message. We go with the best intention. Because we, we cannot show, you know, when we carry the gun, like down sound, and oh, I come with a good intention. The people don't think in that way, right? So how, like we, when you go to Afghanistan, like how do you use the, like and one more the specific tactics like how in your experience what is the best way to conduct the IO to put this cultural diplomacy to show our yeah, best that's a great question that's a great question and, and I mean I could probably speak for hours on that um, but but at the end of the day IO is not a separate line of operation IO has got to be integral to everything that you do and so here's a prime example uh, General Crystal let out a, an order that we would treat all Afghans with respect and digni dignity and, and engage and when you look someone in the eye and you talk to them and you don't make promises you can't keep. So there's all sorts of tools, there's, there's radio stations, there's pamphlets, there's everything but at the end of the day, look the people in the eye, engage every way that you can. And then when you make a commitment, you live up to the commitment. And uh, that, that was effective for me. It, it worked for me. And, and we had, I, I buried 23 people in Afghanistan of, of coalition and hundreds of Afghans. So it's a tough, it's not easy. But that it, it definitely has to be integral to everything you do. Sir. Uh, Governor Uzgani, a yeah, good friend. Actually, it's not much more closer, but it's a good difference. I know how conservative that uh, uh, Uzgani is. Uh, my question is that you really understood that the main causes of uh, uh, not being successful, uh, for example, your, uh, what, I, what I can say is the obstacles on, on the way for uh, bringing change in, that, uh, in Afghanistan. You have had a very good analysis from what I have heard recently from you. Uh, but uh, I'm asking that why is the, the uh, I mean, the U.S. mission in Afghanistan is not so much successful beyond having such a kind of great analysis. Why that money has gone through the subcontractors that now those people who have contracted have taken the money out of the country and have, uh, you know, have had, uh, their, you know, business outside the country and the country is stuck for, and the money did not change to the lower, uh, lower level of the community where it was supposed to reach. Um, so do you think that these challenges, most of the thing, the most of the controversial challenges that you have mentioned there, that, that because of conflict among tribal countries, you know, uh, so are, do, you, do, you, do you really think that they are internally or they are also most of them are coming from external sources like the neighboring countries and also the, and also not, uh, uh, not considering the cultural diplomacy what I have understand from the cultural diplomacy because uh, cultural sensitivity and considering the cultural sensitivity and the uh, uh, conservative society that how the approaches should be, I mean how the international community should uh, have their approaches considering all those bar cultural barriers, yeah. uh, religious and cultural barriers that, uh, yeah, most of them have been considered, but still I think it is actually mostly, I just wanted, uh, honestly, shortly, I just want to know that how successful were you um, in, adi uh, in addition to your support for implementing cultural diplomacy, and what changes do you see uh, that uh, in cultural uh, level from, from the South? Yeah, I mean, I, uh, very complex question. First of all, I was also responsible for Daikundi, and, and it's a, to, to get at your question, 
I walked into a school on the top of a mountain in Daikungi built by the by UNICEF in 2005. There were about 800 kids in the school. They were cycling kids through there uh, three classes a day uh, because they couldn't fit all the kids in the school. So I walked in, in the classrooms about the size of this inner area right here. I sat next to the kid in the front row. I looked at his book and, and in his book, I said, what are you studying in my fluent story, which is not, I said, what are you studying? And he showed me third order algebraic equations, which he was solving. And this is, I mean, this is in Daikundi. And so it's a cultural difference also within the tribes. The Hazaras are, are unbelievable people. And, and they, have, they have been able to grasp education and now they're beginning to run Afghanistan from a, from a, a lower level, you know, in, in, in within the government building themselves up. And so it can be done. Uh, a lot of the problems you run into is it just, it, from a U.S. Army perspective, it takes a lot of training. I mean, that was my second year there. If I had gone into Brigade Command my first year there, I would not have been nearly as successful. So there's a lot of training that has to happen. The rotations hurt because you get someone that goes in and he, say, he finally learns what he's doing after he's been there about six or eight months. And then it's time for him to go home and a new guy comes in. And now, how does that transfer go? Are you transferring the projects well? Have you been able to transfer all those learning? No. So it, it's, it's a tough environment and, and the way we've done it I, I'm not sure what we could have done better, but there's clearly things we could have done better. Sir. Yes, good afternoon. Um, how much allocation was given to scholarships to send in, yeah. um, send in the population abroad to, to the U.S.? Or Quite Europe? a bit. So the, the best one in my mind was sponsored by the UAE. And the UAE brought the mullahs out of all the different provinces, out of 34 provinces in Afghanistan, back to the UAE, and and uh, help them in literacy. Many of the mullahs aren't literate, and so when you talk about the mullah is not literate, but the mullah is the one reading the Quran. Well, wait, wait, wait. how's the, the mullah reading the Quran if he can't read? And so, what is he teaching? And 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 so the UAE did one, and they and I think they're still doing that. Uh, when I talked to Ambassador Nasabi a couple months ago, I, I got the impression that they were still doing that. The other one that's doing great is India. And, and India uh, is very focused on teachers and very focused on health care. So they, they've helped out with that. Pakistan has also offered it, but clearly, I can tell you stories, but that, that's a little bit problematic. So there, there is a, a large focus on doing that. And the challenge is you lose those folks for a year or two and then hopefully they come back. But a lot of times, you know, we pay, here's an example. We pay an interpreter up to $600 a month. How much does a teacher make? Less than 100. So if you're a teacher and you're educated and you're in your school and the coalition comes in and said, I'm going to give you 600 bucks and I'm going to give you a place to stay in Kabul. How about that? Oh, you mean I don't have to stay in a hut with no water and no sanitation? and get paid 100 bucks, I can make 600 bucks. Hey, I'm in. So then you build a school, and you wonder why there's no teachers. So it, it's, we shoot ourselves on foot quite a bit. What else? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm time, I'm, I guess we're good. Anyone else? <coughs> Sir. Uh, my name is Ahmed, and I'm representing Pakistan. Um, I work in an NGO, so I understand the importance of sustainability for any Yeah, but the, the number one thing in my mind is when a contract is written, sustainability should be in the contract. So in other words, we build a, we build a road, we reduce the time to travel from, Con, from Kandahar to Tarankat from 22 hours to less than six hours. But when we wrote the contract, we didn't have a tail on it that covered the maintenance of the road. So who knows how long that road's going to be good. So, so that's, that's the first thing. So while the money is there, Build the sustainability into the contract. 
Okay, then the second, in my mind, the second thing is, think about the complexity of the, con, of the, of, of the project. And so, a lot of times, what is Afghan good enough? So in other words, we look at it and we say, well, this building is good enough to be in New York City. Right, but that's not the requirement. The requirement is for it to be Afghan good enough, and therefore the buildings that they built, which have sustained centuries worth of weathering, are still in existence. And so don't build something that requires a ton of maintenance. And, we, and we've, we've made mistakes in both of those areas. So yeah, just a short answer. I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am. Um, hi, my name is Manasa. I'm from India. Just a quick question and a build up on a couple of other questions that were brought up. You spoke of Aisha. And if that case fell in your domain of responsibility, I would like to know how you went about dealing with it because I understand it was very culturally sensitive. At that yeah, so that case happened before I got there. Okay. And, and so I was not there when it happened. But there was a case that, that we call Romeo and Juliet. It was, it was um, a young lady had moved from Zabel into Kazurzgan, so about 80 miles away. And her family had moved in, and she fell in love with her next door neighbor. She's about 18, 17. Um, but she had already been betrothed in Zabo. So her brothers came from Zabo and killed two or three of the family in Kazurzga. Then the brothers of the, of the husband, or the, the boyfriend, went down to Zabo and killed seven of her relatives down there. Okay, it's just, I look at that, I'm just, so the way we dealt, dealt with it, is um, the, the governor, who, who had not been appointed, so that's a challenge, is the appointment of district governors, which is a whole other issue. But the, the lead guy in Kazurzgan, and a young captain, the United States Army, 24 years old, brought the families together and, and hammered out a deal in the tribal way. So it's just like, listen, you guys gotta stop killing each other, this is craziness. And then the way we, we extracted the couple, and, and actually the Australians uh, helped us extract the people, the, the, the couple. So, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's about having a shura and, and letting the, all, all the captain did was provide a secure environment for the governor to, to, to enable the tribal interaction. Uh, it's, that's the way we handle it, and it worked. It, I mean, it, it worked, but it wasn't after until it was pretty hairy for a while. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Yuri Chenovs. I'm originally from Latvia, but I'm both a science professor at Paris College in New York now. Okay. Uh, my question is about corruption. Yeah. I really like the way you said that the very concept of corruption is different in Afghanistan. Could you give us a few specific examples? What would be corruption in Afghanistan and how that differs in Western concepts? Yeah, I, you know, Juma Ghul, who was a brigadier general. So here's the deal. So he's a brigadier general in the, in the Afghan National Police. He weighs about 300 pounds. So anytime you see a 300-pound Afghan, you just, you got to wonder. Okay, so, and uh, so Juma Ghul was an effective cop. And after I'd been there about two months, we had some complaints about him going into koalas and going into households, which stopped. We were able to get him to stop. But on his task kill, which is the number of police officers in Erzgan, he claimed 3,000. But I was only ever able to account for 2,000. So Cobble's paying him for 3,000. He's paying 2,000. What happens to the rest of the money? Well, why is he a 300-pound Afghan? So, so that's, that's one example. He did the same thing with fuel. Um, no, no, so, ma'am.
So do you think is it, it's only the Afghan government who is dealing with this kind of corruption issue? And uh, since I'm working with the Ministry of Education, I, I was working actually before, and uh, you may care that there are some schools without students, but uh, the payments are, I mean, yeah. in, uh, maybe, maybe more than 40,000 students or maybe hundreds uh, thousands of students we have, uh, we don't have, but still uh, the government, I mean, the schools, they receive the payments. But some international organizations who are supporting Ministry of Education, uh, they, they also involved in some how. Do you, do you think it's true or not, or what's ill? So, so what's that? So it's a great question. In, in, yeah, so um, because it's not only the government, maybe it's the international society for supporting the government also involved in the corruption. It could be. It, it could be. The, and I, w I would just counter it with intent, okay? And it goes back to the last census was in 1974. And so my minister of education, when I first got there, was a guy named Rock Matula, who was about as corrupt as you get. And we were able to get him removed, okay, for various different reasons, but the biggest one was, was corruption. And, and then we got a new guy in there who was great. He had a master's degree in education, but he was... He was not the most assertive guy. And so the problem that you run into is the numbers. He comes back and he says, I've got 77 schools, or whatever the number was, 77 schools. How do you know that those schools are all there? And so I, I made an effort to go to the schools. I went to one school, and it was there, bigger in Stuttgart. It was beautiful. Nice granite building, almost as nice as the one in, in Daikundi. But... Of all the classrooms, they were all full of dope. They had hashish drying in the classrooms. But I'm sure he was getting paid for that school. And so we made them burn it, and then you know we would go back there, you know, and but because there's no accountability. And so if you're an NGO or you're a government helping the Ministry of Education, all you're getting is the numbers from the districts. But the validity of those numbers is very hard to verify. One, because it's just hard to get around. Two, because some of the places to get around, you get shot. Three, because a lot of the ministers of education are making a whole lot of money by you not knowing the right numbers. So, I mean, I, I felt very proud of what we had done. But clearly, at the end of the day, there's a lot to be done. And so... You can say that the, the foreign NGO, whoever was part of it, it may be true, I don't know, but I do know that unless, and, and I, I'm in an NGO now, and, and so I, I've been to Islamabad, I've been to New Delhi, I've been to Kabul, I've been to, because you can't know unless you go. And even when you go to the capital, I mean, the famous, the famous line about Islamabad is, if you go to Islamabad and you stand in the center, and then you can go 10 miles and enter Pakistan. And so understanding what's the environment at the local level is always a difficult thing. And so some of those NGOs, I think, accepted the, at face value the numbers that were given to them, and it may or may not have been right. 